All right. I believe I'm in shot on both live streams. So very few movements are as iconic in our generation as Greenpeace. I mean, it doesn't matter where you grew up in the Western world, everyone's heard the term Greenpeace. I remember when I was, uh, you know, going through a typical Victoria kid, you know, go through the education system, go to university. Greenpeace, they're the good guys. I mean, they're fighting the bad guys, right? It's just that simple. Good guys, bad guys. Now, behind the scenes, if you watch a documentary or behind the music on VH1 about your favorite rock band, you realize behind the scenes is way more complicated, way more messy, and way more interesting than the, just the simplicity you see on media. So tonight, you guys have an extremely privileged chance to speak to one of the co-founders of one of the most iconic movements in our, of our generation, and that is Dr. Patrick Moore and Greenpeace. Can I get a round of applause? And we had a pleasant chat upstairs in the VIP room, and, and he's even more interesting than I thought he was. So, <laughs> Now, he's been in the game for over 40 years. Uh, he is a PhD scientist. Uh, he is a salmon farmer. I, I won't blow the thunder. I'll let him toot his own whistle. Uh, he's one of the founding members, contrary to the criticism recently, he is one of the founding generational members of the Greenpeace movement. For nine years, he was president of Greenpeace Canada, and for seven years, he was the director international of Greenpeace. So I don't know about you, but that makes him part of Greenpeace's leadership, right? <laughs> yes. The OG. You're talking to an OG tonight, guys. Now in 86, Dr. Moore, led by principle and the fact that he is a trained scientist, he left the movement. And in one sentence, he's been quoted as saying, he left it because, quote unquote, they abandoned science and logic in favor of emotion and sensationalism. And we would all agree with that in here. In 2015, Dr. Moore joined the founding meeting of the CO2 Coalition in Washington, D.C. Anybody here familiar with the CO2 Co Coalition? Okay, those of you who aren't, it is simply the antithesis of the scare tactic and sensationalism of hyper-environmentalism. Okay, these are top-tier, world-renowned scientists who've come together and they've formed a, f a powerhouse to combat the misinformation that is put out there about environmental sensitive materials, CO2, is it a greenhouse gas, or is it a natural emission, etc. Now, in uh, 2019, in April, Dr. Moore has actually been elected as chairman of the board of the CO2 Coalition and now serves as its director. So he's going to give us a, a speech, and then I'm going to interview him in the end, and we're going to have some Q&A time after that. So welcome to a wonderful evening with Dr. Patrick Moore. Thank you for that lovely introduction, and ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this presentation. And uh, it's nice to see so many people turning out. Um, I have a theory, and it's sort of mirrored in the title of my latest book, that all the scare stories in the world today are based on things that are either invisible, like carbon dioxide, radiation, and the supposedly bad thing in GMO foods, which actually doesn't have a name. Everything has a name. So if it doesn't have a name, it doesn't exist. And that is, the, that is a fact. It's a fake thing. Whereas CO2 and radiation are real things, just that you can't see what they're doing. Or very remote, like polar bears and coral reefs. That's precisely why they use them as the icons of the Earth dying because you can't go and see it for yourself, and hardly anybody else can either. This is the universal theory of scare stories. And so just think about that every time someone tries to tell you something's gonna kill you or whatever. Oh, great. Oh, it did start to work. This is where I grew up, on the very northwest tip of Vancouver Island in the most northern port on the coast. My dad's logging camp here, 
and where I grew up from a, ch a, a baby, basically, to, to, to when I was sent off to boarding school in Vancouver. There was no road to Winter Harbor until 1965, when 75 kilometers of gravel finally made it there. We thought the place was going to boom now, because it was a pretty small, small population. Half the people used the road to get out. <laughs> we learned something about human nature that day. Okay, so I was sent off to boarding school in Vancouver where I excelled in science and then got to the University of BC for a BSc in science in forestry and biology and uh, then I went on to, to a PhD in ecology and while I was doing that, this is me back then. I don't know why I looked like a hippie but uh, that was because it was the hippie era and uh, we went out into the Pacific Ocean to stop the Japanese and Soviet whalers, the Russian whalers, from killing 30,000 large whales a year. Every year they'd been doing that all through the 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s. We came along in the 70s. And it took us five years of going out there every year getting in front of the harpoons in our little boats. Here's the big factory ship where they drag the whales, uh, dead whales up through that hole in the back. And there's the, on the killer ship of which there was about 12 or 15 of them. They just massacred whole herds of those whales in short order. Here I am in front of the harpoon to protect the fleeing whales. And this is the kind of thing that got us on TV around the world. Let's see if I can make that happen. I don't know how the sound will be on this, but this is what we, we did for a living there for a while. Well, it wasn't much of a living, but they fed us anyways. So you can see the whales in the front and the zodiac in the middle. The, the, the shoulder with the blowhole come right out of the water. And then uh, you can see the guy crouching, getting ready to shoot. The only rule we kept was every time they pointed the gun another way, we'd swivel in front of them. And uh, we came up in one wave, and there he was, and we were looking right in the back. I thought we were kind of plugged, like, like couldn't possibly shoot. Then we went down, and then that fantastic sound, and you could hear the of the, of the cable. And I guess we both ducked at that point, and I don't know what happened. That's my late best friend Bob Hunter in the boat with George Kurotva. And that's the chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, there it is. It's not a pretty sight. After the whale campaign, we went to, st to stop the slaughter of 250,000 nursing seal pups on the ice flows off the east coast of Canada. It didn't make us a lot of friends in some parts of the country, but it wasn't exactly the right thing to be doing to a wild animal. We don't do that with terrestrial animals, so why are we doing it with seals? I saw a situation where a hunter clubbed a baby seal uh, after it had dragged it away from its mother and left the, left the carcass lying there. The mother waddled over to it and put it under his chin and cried. And because they're mammals just like us and they actually cry when, they, when somebody does that to their baby. So uh, it took another five years or so to get this stopped and now they're not doing it anymore and they never needed to in the first place because they had UI by this time and uh, they were just using it for the fur, they weren't even using the meat. Greenpeace lost its humanitarian perspective along the way. The peace in Greenpeace is about people and stopping nuclear war and war in general but all they came back with was the green and now all of a sudden humans were being characterized as the enemies of nature as if we were the only evil species on the planet, the enemies of life. That, that's way too much like original sin for me. I just don't buy it. We are mostly good people, and there's a few bad people that make it difficult. But Greenpeace became one of the bad people at this time in my estimation. So, because I think humanitarianism is the correct approach to, hum to humans and to seek peace instead of berating them for being evil. Then the other thing that happened, that was sort of the philosophical reason why I had to leave, 
because I couldn't be in an organization that thought humans were evil, you know, inherently evil, was that my fellow directors, of, of which we were six, decided, and none of them had any formal science education. They were political activists, eco-activists, there to get a living in the environmental movement or whatever. By this time we had a lot of money coming in, 100 million plus, and uh, they decided that we should have a campaign to ban chlorine worldwide because it's toxic and it was used as a weapon in the first war by the Germans and so yes it can be a, a toxic substance like all of the halogens they're very reactive elements chlorine, bromine, fluorine, iodine, adenosine they're all in the same part of the periodic table but they're all very uh, interesting and very useful for example I said you guys table salt is sodium chloride it is an essential nutrient for all animals so, like, maybe we should take that into account before we ban chlorine worldwide. That's why Gandhi made salt at the sea, was because it was an essential nutrient and the British were taxing the people in India ex exorbitantly. I think it was one of the most beautiful things he did in his life. And then on the other hand, adding chlorine to drinking water is the biggest advance in the history of public health preventing cholera and other waterborne communicable diseases and swimming pools and spas too and hot tubs you name it and in addition to that 85 percent of our pharmaceuticals are made with chlorine chemistry and 25 percent of them have chlorine in them look at the substances on your flu and cold pills and you'll see a little cl in there so i had to leave because they decided to adopt that campaign and after i left they continued with it. Oh, that sounds better. They continued with it for a few years until they realized it wasn't going to work very well. But I had to go because of that. I'm sorry how complicated this graph is, but I'll just tell you that what this shows is the blue line is temperature going back 570 million years when life emerged from being single-celled to multicellular. So this was the Cambrian explosion of modern life forms. And the purple line is CO2. Now you can see that back in the beginning of this graph, CO2 was at 6,000 parts per million. And this is when life began to flourish in the sea. And then you have a situation where there's an ice age named the Silurian, the first one there with the blue line dropping down dramatically in the Earth's temperature, but the CO2 didn't go down with it. So why did the Earth get an ice age when CO2 was 5, 6,000 ppm, when it's only 420 now, and went down to as low as 180 during the most recent glacial maximum? 20,000 years ago. Then you see, though, that there's a bit of correlation in the next ice age, which is called the Karoo in the Carboniferous era, when trees evolved. And there's too much to talk about there. But uh, you see that they are originally, initially in sync, but then suddenly the temperature went way up while the CO2 stayed right down where it was. And in the end of all this, you see that big red circle. There, they're both out of sync with each other for 200 million years. Where the temperature goes up and the CO2 goes down. The CO2 goes up, the temperature goes down. In the final analysis, if you analyze, and it's true that today, CO2 and temperature are both low. So they are correlated today in, in, in a slice of time. But in the overall time, of the last 570 million years, they are slightly negatively correlated. This means there is no possibility that they are a cause-effect relationship. They are simply in correlation with each other some of the time. And this is an important slide because correlation is not necessarily, I put that word in there, causation. Because causation requires correlation if one thing is causing another consistently, they will follow each other nicely. And here is a perfect correlation between shark attacks and ice cream consumption. <laughs> Many correlations, even if they're very strongly related, are the result of a third, uh, third factor. In this case, summer and winter. 
In the summer, people go to the beach, have an ice cream, go swimming, and get attacked by a shark. In the winter, neither of those things happen. And that is why they are strongly correlated. There's a website that everyone should look at. It's called Spurious Correlations. And it shows you all like a hundred or more correlations between two things that are obviously not in the slightest bit coral in cause-effect relationship. Then neither of them are happening to each other. Okay, now we, I'm going to just go forward in time all through these next few slides. This is from 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs were extincted by a asteroid hitting Yucatan and blackening the skies in the stratosphere so that all the plants pretty well died because there wasn't enough sun for them for four or five years. And that's why the dinosaurs went extinct. And it wasn't just the dinosaurs, it was many other species. Many, about 65% of all species died in that event. But that has nothing to do with the temperature of the Earth. After the dinosaurs died, it continued to rise to, to one of the cold, warmest periods in the whole history of the Earth, the Eocene Thermal Maximum, where you can see the ocean temperature was 16 degrees Celsius, and then began the 50 million year decline in temperature leading into today's Pleistocene Ice Age which started 2.6 million years ago, only 2.6 million years ago. There was no ice in the northern hemisphere until about three, four million years ago. Antarctica started getting ice on it 30 million years ago. And then it melted a bit and then it came back again. So Antarctica has been glaciated for way longer than the Arctic has been because the southern a part of the world is much colder than the northern part due to the fact that it's almost all ocean. And land heats up way easier than ocean does because water can absorb so much more heat than just the surface of the land because the ocean's in circulation and the heat goes down into the bottom and it just keeps turning over and absorbing sunlight uh, and giving off energy. So th this just shows you that we are actually in one of the coldest periods in the history of the Earth right now. It is called the Pleistocene Ice Age. And it's st this is still the Pleistocene Ice Age. That's why there's so much ice on both poles. But this is an interglacial period. And here you see the, la the most recent 5 million years, 5.5 million years of the Earth's temperature. And it's arbitrary where you say the Pleistocene began and the other part was a different name. But we have done that. We have just said, okay, it's gone down so far that now we call this a new era, the Pleistocene Ice Age. Because it's gone down to as cold as the Earth has ever been in the last at least 500 million years. And as you can see, the Pleistocene is still getting colder. It's, it's at the, down here, the bottom is the cold. That's, that's the last half million years. And it's not going back up right now. It's still going down. And they're pretending that we're going to have a climate disaster from the heat. Dick Linson, a physicist from MIT Emeritus, uh, says that he can't understand why people are afraid of a 1.5 degree Celsius increase in global temperature when that is less than the difference between breakfast and lunch, if you think about it. Between breakfast and lunch, it's going to increase by more than 1.5 degrees Celsius on any given day, anywhere in the world, except in the frozen Arctic when there's no sun there and the frozen Antarctic when there's no sun there, which is the other part of the year. But this is, what the, this is it. We are at the tail end of a 50 million year cooling period. And there's no indication that it's going to go up on average anywhere. This is the most recent four interglacial periods. You can see here that the 41 year cycle switching called the Pleistocene conundrum, because no one knows why it did, to the 100,000 year cycle, there were over 40, more than 40 interglacial and glacial maximums, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. This is the last four, most recent four ups and downs. As you can see, they are very regular. They're approximately 100,000 years apart. Also, as you can see, 
the three glacial ma sorry the, the three warming periods interglacial periods which is the tops were warmer than this one is and whatever will be because we're almost at the end of the average age of an interglacial period about 10 12,000 years see that co2 and temperature co2 being blue temperature being red are in very close correlation with each other so al gore says it's obvious that the CO2 is causing the temperature to go up and down. When in fact, there's a, about an 800 year lag where the, the CO, the temperature goes up first and then the CO2 goes up. And the reason for that is the oceans contain 50 times as much, almost 50 times as much CO2 as the atmosphere does. So when the oceans warm, they absorb gas from the atmosphere. That's how it works. And when they cool, they let gas off into the atmosphere. Not just CO2, but oxygen and nitrogen and the other gases in the ocean. And the, the uh, proof you can do to show that's true is put a glass of water in the fridge and let it sit there till it gets really cold. Then take it out and watch as it warms up the bubbles that form inside the glass. That is the gas coming out because of the warming. Put it back in the fridge, the bubbles disappear again. And the ocean and the atmosphere are doing that same thing. Now look at the blue line at the very far right. Look at it go up to 415, now it's 420 or something uh, parts per million. The temperature didn't follow it up, not in the slightest. If it was a strong correlation between CO2 and temperature, the temperature would go up with the CO2. It wouldn't just stay down there where it was already. That's pretty much of a proof. Here's my favorite one. This is from 1560 or so, in the peak of the Little Ice Age. This was the coldest it had been for the last 10,000 years since we came out of the most recent glaciation into the Holocene interglacial. The first 5,000 years of the interglacial is called the Holocene thermal optimum because that is when it was warmest. For the last 6,000 years it has been cooling gradually, but every once in a while it has another up blip. So it goes like this and up and down and up and down and up and down and up for the last 6,000 years. We happen to be in an up right now of about one degree in the last 400 years. That's the red line. Note that those yellow lines there, the, the, the older record back in the, about 1600 is longer and more increase in temperature than the one that's at right about now. There is no actual difference that can be seen caused by the black line which is the CO2 emissions line. That's our CO2 emissions didn't even really start in earnest till about 1800. And when they did, they rose up exponentially like that, and they don't appear to have the slightest influence on the, in, any increase in temperature. So that's CO2 and temperature from 500 million years ago to just a few centuries ago. Unbelievable. I'm sorry it's not so easy to read when it's in a small format like this, but I'm glad I put those big numbers in there this morning. This is death from, colds at, from cold and death from heat in Europe. The original graph that was put out is the one on the left, where death from cold is blue and death from heat is um, just a minute. Yes, deaths from heat is red. Clearly there's more deaths from cold than from heat. But that wasn't good enough for them. This is from Lancet, which is supposed to be a science publication in medicine. You see that the 50 and the 10 there. So they put the cold on a different scale than the heat. And when Bjorn Lomberg took these data, that you get the one that's on the right. Mm -hmm. And this is just recently, it's only like a short time ago that this was done. So they're just plain bald-faced lying and no expecting nobody's gonna notice that they had a five times different scale 
on the one than the other. Okay, we'll talk about subjects now because I think the main thing about learning about climate change is, to, is where they are saying the bad things it's doing. Now, one of those things they say is bad is warming, but as you've seen, there's not much to worry about there because 1.5 degrees is less than between breakfast and lunch. And CO2 isn't doing it. And CO2 isn't doing it, correct. Oh, so there's a claim that there's a sea of plastic garbage twice the size of Texas in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. The middle of the Pacific Ocean is very remote, and this is a fake image, of course. It's just a Photoshop thing. Here's another one, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. That wasn't taken from a satellite. It's almost as big as the lower 48 states of the U.S. That's way more than twice the size of Texas. And then there's this one showing a brown blob about half about the size of Brazil. That's the plastic nation has emerged and threatens to kill the oceans in less than 10 years. Now how does plastic kill the oceans? Right? And I get all this stuff about toxic plastic. Oh yeah, that's why we wrap our food in it. That's why we have all of our food in the fridge in plastic containers and baggies to keep it from being contaminated. Why do hospitals use plastic for intravenous tubing and blood bags and gloves and caps and so many other things? Because it's non-toxic, that's why. Absolutely, totally non-toxic. Even PVC, which is polyvinyl chloride, in other words, contains chlorine, is rendered non-toxic by the polyvinyl part. It is totally inert. And as a matter of fact, it's one of the most important plastics because it can absorb colors and it can absorb antibiotics. So hospitals put their floors and their walls with plastic that is imbued with antibiotics to keep germs from being able to live there. And this whole, th the, the, the anti-plastic thing is basically a proxy against fossil fuels. Because you've seen these, have you seen this picture with the big oil rig in the harbor? And there's all these kayaks. They're all surrounding this oil rig to protest it. The, the kayaks are made of plastic. The paddles are made of plastic. Their raincoats are made of plastic. Everything is made of plastic, right? And, and that is made from oil, by and large. It's one of the best products that's ever been created in the history of civilization, and it's non-toxic. So they say when it goes into the ocean, it suddenly becomes toxic somehow. No, it doesn't. It remains inert. But it's not nice to have this much plastic in the ocean. Actually, mo most of that is not plastic, but much of it is because there's a lot of plastic in our world. And you can see briefly that down at the bottom there where that red arrow is, it says a part of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And I, I studied the picture and I thought, that sure looks like mountains in the background. There's mountains in there. Well, it is actually the Pacific, but it's the remains, it's, the, it's the, the, the material that was washed into the sea by the tsunami in Japan, which killed nearly 20,000 people. It's kind of irreverent to blame that on the Pacific garbage patch, you know? That's dirty pool. But that's what they do. This is the only picture that shows actually some real stuff floating on the ocean. This is a German satellite composite image of the whole Pacific Ocean taken over a year where they choose the places that don't have clouds and then pick, pick, pitch, put them all together. Now the Great Pacific Garbage Patch doesn't just hide under clouds, right? It's got to be there somewhere where you could see it if you had all the clouds gone. No, it's not there. It is absolutely 100% fake. There is no basis in it whatsoever. And when this boat went out for 48 days searching for plastic between Hawaii and California, this is what they found. It's almost all discarded fishing gear. There's a reason for, the, for that happening. Fishermen don't have much room on their boats for anything but fish and ice. They don't want to have a huge net that's been damaged, have to take up half the deck or half the, 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 the hold. So they throw it overboard. Well, then all kinds of things start to live on it. 
barnacles, mussels, crabs. It actually provides habitat in the same way that driftwood does. It's no different, it just got color. But the beauty of plastic is driftwood never takes a shape like this. And Greenpeace says the crab is trapped in the cup. No, it's using it as a house. It's using it for protection. It's habitat, right? How about this? A little plastic float is providing habitat for hundreds of gooseneck barnacles, pelagic gooseneck barnacles. And about 150 species of marine life benefit from plastic floating in the ocean and sinking to the bottom like a plastic, a, you know, clear plastic it sinks. So lots of plastic things are made with clear plastic. They are more dense than water. The colored plastic, because of the infusion of the color into the PVC, generally floats. And when I tell people all about this, they come up after and say, you know, the reason you can't see the plastic is because only the clear plastic is in the Pacific garbage patch. That's their first attempt. That's pretty l lame. And I'm, I'm saying, no, you're wrong, because actually clear plastic sinks, so it's not the clear plastic. Oh, it's just below the surface, they say. That's why you can't see it. And I'm going, yeah, every piece of plastic has a buoyancy compensation device on it. Like, they're all different densities, but the ones that are dense sink to the bottom. And then they say, it's microplastic. Oh, you mean it's invisible and I can't see it, right? People from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans from Nanaimo Biological Station, which I've been associated with through all kinds of different ways, uh, went out there just a few years ago with screens that were micro, micro screens and pulled them up through the water column and they thought, well, we must be doing something wrong because there's nothing in there. No, they're not doing anything wrong. Microplastics is just a made-up story. And then they say the microplastic is getting into the fish's liver and going in the bloodstream and all of that. No, our bodies and every other animal's body knows not to take in things that are indigestible. That's why that stuff comes out the back end of them. Because it wasn't digestible. That's what, I, did, I just realized this, that fiber with regard to nutrition is material that you cannot digest. I never knew that, but I thought fiber was a stringy thing. But no, it's something you can't digest. And so if you can't digest it, it won't go in your bloodstream because it's gonna be rejected, even if it's micro. Because everything becomes micro at that level. It, it, it's all broken down into individual uh, molecules to get into your blood through the colon there. You know, it's just like another, an, a, a, another uh, myth is that if people eat, uh, if the fish eat something big, like a piece of plastic, it'll get stuck in them. There's a reason why the in-hole is quite a bit smaller than the out-hole in all animal life, right? It wouldn't work very well the other way if you could swallow something bigger than could get out of you, you know. Just basic biology. No snorting. <laughs> I'm glad I made you laugh. Al, but uh, this, this guy is really bad. He, he is evil. He says albatross are feeding plastic bags to their chicks, giving them plastic bags to eat, right? Well, that would suffocate, they would die just right away from not being able to breathe or put anything else in there afterwards. It's, it's a lie. Albatross adults never give plastic bags to their chicks. And here's a, here's a young woman who works with Attenborough showing a plastic bag but she doesn't show it in a chick. And here's all the stuff they say were in the chicks. They lie. There is an adult albatross giving, not feeding. It's not food. It is appropriate sized and shaped bits of plastic to go into the gizzard to help grind their food in the gizzard. 
because birds don't have teeth and if they swallow us they have to swallow a squid whole and you know what they do they keep the beak in their gizzard to act as one of the grinding me mechanisms and they don't swallow anything sharp or too big they just find the, look at how how, how um, similar all these pieces are and look what they show the people no, not only could a, a, an albatross chick not be able to contain that much plastic in it but you see that little pink thing in the middle it's sharp as a nail they're not going to give that to the chick they're only going to give the chick rounded pieces that have gone through maybe over the surf on the beach and got rounded and shaped properly because birds seabirds can't use pebbles like land birds can because there's no pebbles in the sea all birds give their chicks either gravel or marine debris as a grinding in their gizzard birds have a, a second stomach that is like ours but they, they can only put stuff in there that can be digested by acid like we can chew it first and always chew your food well and uh, but they can't do that so their parents give them this a digestive aid is what it is and uh, and then when 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 the chicks grow up just like the parents they put they do the same thing they put it in their own gizzards all through their life a piece of plastic like those I showed you there might last six months or a year until it's worn down to nothing and they have to get and re replenish it all the time so th this plastic is beneficial to the seabirds because before that they were looking for pumice which is uh, undersea volcanic rock that's that's foam so it floats they have to find the right sizes and shapes of that in little pebbles and and nuts like that fall off trees into the ocean and bits of driftwood they've used bits of driftwood forever especially knots that have been you know worn down into something the right size and shape so that's the story and this is a lie and even the, the Smithsonian Institute goes along with Greenpeace on this stuff out of, out of Washington DC okay that's the birds and the squids and stuff this is where all the carbon is and what you see there the red are the flows the annual flows of carbon from photosynthesis into plants from plants into litter and from litter into soils and uh, the blue are stocks they are the amount that is there one year and the next year and the next year and the next year and of course in the atmosphere it's going up but right about now there's 850 billion tons of CO2 of, of carbon as CO2 I used I, we, I just use carbon here because it means, means makes everything equal um, so those you see all those numbers there uh, the ocean has about 50 times as much co2 in it as I mentioned before than the atmosphere does and that's re represented down there and there's a constant flux between the ocean and the atmosphere there's an equilibrium on the surface it's called Henry's law it even has a physics equation called Henry's law now look at the carbon in the earth's crust fossil fuels are between 5,000 and 10,000 billion tons of carbon and there's probably quite a lot more than that this is just what's known but we also know that the earth's crust contains 100 million billion tons of carbonaceous rocks can you name a carbonaceous rock for me coal no limestone chalk and marble are all different stages of carbonaceous rocks being created by life all of that came from life and it's stuck in the earth's crust today that doesn't work for you I'll tell you more about that in a minute this is when I went back 400 540 million years this is what life looked like the Burgess Shale in Yoho National Park contains fossils of these soft creatures that didn't have any skeletons or shells 
because they were inundated by a mud flow and the oxygen was immediately taken away that could have uh, the, so the body parts. So the soft body parts were preserved. That's why it's such an important place. You can go in there in the summer. You can walk in there. It's not, not a hard walk. I did it. And it's wonderful to see these fossils just coming out of the cliff. Uh, and so, but you, as you can see, not that many f forms of life had shells on them. They were almost like, mostly like jellyfish. Whereas eventually, hundreds of marine species of all different genera and types learned to combine calcium with carbon dioxide and make calcium carbonate shells for themselves. On the far left you have the um, I know what it is. Cal no, on the far left are the coccolithophores. That's right. Those are microscopic. They are plants inside those skeletons. They are, they, they are, in other words, they are the basis of the food chain in the sea. And then on the other side, you have the foraminifera. Each of the holes in the net, in the net-like structure, can take a coccolithophore in as they go sideways through the water grazing on these planktons, which are in thick, thick abundance. So that's the basis of the food chain in the ocean. And then, the, of course, the corals are actually responsible for about 50% of all the calcium carbi carbonate production in the world. And then the shellfish on top, and then the, the, the crustaceans, the crabs, the shrimp, and the, those kind of things. Um, among them all, they have caused 100 million billion tons of carbon to be removed from the oceanic and atmospheric cycle and buried in the earth where they are no longer available for life. That is the, the true story. Now here we have this island we live on here where they have Limestone Island, Limestone Lake, Imperial Limestone Company, the Limestone Lions, the Limestone Islet, and Limestone Mountain. At least half of Vancouver Island is made of limestone, which was at one time obviously under the ocean, and millions of years of sediment of the shells of de dead shellfish falling to the bottom and being buried in the sediments and then turning hard because of the heat and, and uh, pressure of the hundreds of feet above them. And a lot can happen in half a billion years. The White Cliffs of Dover are the skeletons of coccolithophores. 14 miles and they go down deeper and deeper into the ocean, you can see there, and they go way back into the land. And they're just those little tiny beautiful round microscopic balls that have made this chalk. Okay, we talk about coral reefs now, about 50% of all the calcium carbonate. Oh no, this isn't the coral reef section. This is just showing a beautiful picture of a coral reef in the coral triangle with a beautiful turtle. And uh, you can see after 50 million years, 100 million years, 300 million years, how much coral has been laid down. Because every t especially recently as we've been going through this Pleistocene Ice Age, the sea has been rising 400 feet and then falling 400 feet every 40 to 100,000 years. And every time the sea falls, all the coral dies that's up 400 feet higher. And when the sea, sea comes up again, the coral comes back up with it, making new coral. And that's been, and so this idea that the islands in the Pacific are going to be inundated, they are growing up with the sea level rise. It is true that some parts of the earth might have a slight sea level rise, but it, it, two things I say. First, you won't have to run. It's two millimeters a year. And second, if you're really that much worried about it, hire the Dutch. 25% of their country is below sea level. And they're farming most of the food for Europe, the largest production of European food. So don't worry about that sort of stuff. Look at the variety. And all of these turn into limestone, marble, and chalk. Well, the chalk is almost all from coccolithophores because it's fine. The Carboniferous period saw the evolution of lignin. Up until then, for 
quite a few hundred million years, there had been cellulose. Fibrous, was able to make long skinny things stick together, but there was no lignin. Lignin is the concrete of the tree stem. Cellulose is the rebar. And it's a perfect analogy. That's why trees can sway in the same way that concrete columns and high concrete buildings can sway. They have that ability to give a little bit, which makes them not so brittle. Well, if it's just concrete's brittle, that's why 250,000 people died in the earthquake in Haiti not that long ago, because they have substandard concrete with not enough rebar in it, and they're in their houses and it falls on their head. Even though this, the, the tsunami in Japan, which was 20 times larger than the one in Haiti, not, nobody died from the earthquake because they know how to build buildings that are earthquake proof. And so could the Haitians if they got it together. Anyways, this is when the coal was made. Whoop. That coal seam represents a time when there was no species of life that could digest wood because it's made of lignin and it's like a ma matrix. It's indigestible up till then to any living creature. And that's why 50% of all the coal was created in the Carboniferous periods when forest emerged because the trees were just dying and falling on top of each other going up thousands of feet of dead wood. And it got deep enough that it was turned into coal. There's no other, there's no coal seams that weren't in the Carboniferous that are that thick. As I say, 50% of all of it was made then. And interestingly enough though, a, uh, whoop, God, this, this thing is tricky tonight. Interestingly enough, a species evolved, a species of fungus named Tramites produced lignase, an enzyme that could digest lignin called white rot fungi. And it took a hundred million years for that to happen after trees figure, and plants figured out how to make lignin and have tall stems. Because before that, everything was kind of flat on the ground, like a leaf on the ground. There wasn't any stem. And the stemmed plants are all because lignin evolved. And the coal stopped being produced so rapidly when these guys evolved and they ate a whole bunch of those dead trees. Carbon, I call it CO2 replenishment, not CO2 pollution or CO2 emissions or whatever, because every molecule of CO2 that we emit into the atmosphere came from there in the first place. That's how it got into the sediments and the, and the coal and the oil and the gas and the carbonaceous rocks which are at least 90 to 95 percent of that loss of carbon in the atmosphere and thus in the oceans. Because every time you strip carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and then of course there's lots of marine creatures in the ocean that are also eating carbon dioxide. So between the two of them, they stay in balance while they absorb the carbon dioxide and drop it on the ocean at bottom as shells or as trees on land turning into coal. And as oil and gas from the soft bodies of the marine animals, it's basically that the coal is from terrestrial life and the gas and oil is from marine life. CO2 replenishment. We are the salvation of life. No other species was going to come along and replenish the CO2 by burning fossil fuels and making concrete. When we make concrete, we take limestone and slake it into CO2 and calcium oxide. And that is about 10% of our CO2 emissions. And if we need to in the future, when we run out of other energy sources and we don't want the CO2 to go down look too low, we can use sunlight to burn limestone and chalk. And there's enough of that to last for hundreds of millions of years. This is what would have happened if humans hadn't come along and started replenishing the CO2 in the atmosphere. That dotted line there is today. 
or near near today. That's millions of years there. And that is the actual CO2 graph up to today. It, it dropped to 180 parts per million in the most recent glacial maximum 20,000 years ago, but came back up again when these, the oceans warmed to about 280. Uh, by, by the time we started increasing it, it had come back to 280 from 180. But at 180, it is only 30 ppm above the death of, of plants. And who would have come along to fix that? Because that's the way it was going. It looks like a pretty steady trend to me. And so once all the CO2, the CO2 had been sucked out down to 150, life would start to die and continue to die for a long time until it was dead. And we came along and replenished the CO2 in the atmosphere up to now 425 or something. And it's going to keep going up. And the optimum for plant growth is around 1,500. The Royal Horticultural Society, as you see below there, they're supposed to have some scientist in it, I think. <laughs> They think that it's because you talk to your plants that it makes them grow better. No, you have 50,000 parts per million of carbon dioxide in your breath. It's because you breathe on them that they grow faster. And it says women, especially if you're a woman, you make them grow faster. Sucking up to a plant, right? They're just not going to go as close to it as a woman would. <laughs> and so it's because the women are getting closer with more of their CO2, clearly. I, I would love to write a scientific paper on that, but I don't think it's worth it. <laughs> Here's a controlled experiment with CO2 increased above ambient levels starting. At, this was in 2009 that this was done, when CO2 is still only 385. Now it's 425. That's how fast we're increasing it. We don't need to increase it this fast, but we're using the fossil fuels for good things to make stuff and go places. And uh, so it doesn't hurt anything for it to keep going up at the rate it's going up now, at least for a long time. And eventually, when we are smart enough to make more of our electricity with nuclear energy, which I'll talk about shortly, uh, then we don't have to use as much fossil fuels anymore. But then look what it does. I mean, adding CO2 at the bottom of their leaves to take in CO2 when CO2 is much more concentrated. So it also means that they are drought, more drought resistant than the ones that are living in a low CO2 atmosphere. Whoop. Ah, oh, darn it, this thing just is wild on me. This is what uh, farmers put in their greenhouses. This is a CO2 generating machine using natural gas, burning it and making CO2. They usually go 800 to 1200 ppm and get up to 60% more uh, produce than they would if they used natural air for, uh, their, for their CO2. So there's just no question about it. Polar bears will become extinct due to climate change. The fact of the matter is polar bears would not exist if it weren't for climate change. How could polar bears exist if there was no ice and no seals under them, under the ice? That's the way the world was for most of its existence. The only reason polar bears exist is because the world got cold and the Siberian grizzly bears, otherwise you know, Eurasian brown bears, which are same as our grizzly bears because they, they came here from the old world over the land bridge just like people did, and elk and moose and, and, and wolves. And uh, camels and horses went the other way. They were new world animals. The people on the other side, when they saw those camels and horses coming over the land bridge, they, and that was 16,000 years ago or something, they said, that looks interesting. And suddenly those two animals became the main pack horses for thousands of years until machines were invented. For the whole of Asia and Europe and the spice trade and all of that was, and, and race and, and armies and you know, military horses and all of that. The people in the New World who went across there and found these uh, horses and camels ate them all instead. 
uh, except for the al for, 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 for the uh, alpaca and the llama in South America when they when they got down there somebody had finally come to their senses that they could use these things to carry stuff because as you know they just had dogs with sticks on the ground and tra with putting weight on those sticks to drag things around they didn't have any wheels and they and they didn't have any horses or big camels to carry all their stuff so that's why polar bears evolved they evolved when the ice came down to the northern shore of Russia and that the, the, the brown bears went out on the ice and learned to hunt for seals through the holes in the ice, 300 pounds great seals. And uh, it took maybe, oh, 500,000 years for them to become what they are today, but they can still mate successfully, polar bears and, 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 and brown bears, because they were the same species. And they it's called convergent evolution, sorry, divergent. Divergent evolution, where one species turns into two, because they get separated from each other geographically, or they go to different climates where the food is different and everything's different, and that's what happened here. So there would be no polar bears if the Ice Age had not come. National Geographic, this is how low they will stoop. This is what climate change looks like. It took them nine months to admit that they were lying about this. This is a really old male polar bear that is dying and has that thing that dogs get in its back legs and probably has no teeth left. There are no old folks homes for polar bears. They die in the wild just like most creatures do. And this is not anything to do with climate change whatsoever. But they took this picture where in, in the summer where there's, there's a little frost looking, or maybe those are flowers, I don't know. But uh, they just show that that's such a miserable thing to do, to kids especially. This is the extent of Arctic ice right now. It's at its maximum at this time of year because the sun will return at the equinox, or at the solstice, I mean. And every square inch of the Arctic Ocean is covered in ice and the whole of Hudson's Bay, which is not in the Arctic Circle, and the, all of Greenland, which is not all in the Arctic Circle, and the Bering Sea, and down into the, the Nordic countries. Every square inch is covered this year. So I think we should, uh, sorry, this is 23. It's, it, I, I, for, I forgot to put the new one in, but it's, it looks the same as that. And, and there is the summer ice in the bottom right. And as you can see, there's still a lot of ice there at the peak of the melting. And there's a big ring of oceanic water around that ice. And if that was covered in ice in the summer, how would the plankton live? How would they get sunlight? Plankton are the basis of the food chain in the Arctic. The plankton feeds the krill, the krill eat the seeds, feeds the fish, the seals eat the fish and the bears eat the seals. And so nobody's talking about that. This is actually a perfect thing for polar bears. If the earth does warm up someday, the polar bears are gonna be in a lot of trouble. And that's how evolution works. When the climate changes, sometimes species go extinct and new ones replace them. But the polar bear had the advantage of an ice age. And then we wept. Scientists say 93% of the Great Barrier Reef is now bleached. 93% of the Great Barrier Reef is practically dead. Study, over 90% of the Great Barrier Reef is suffering from coral bleaching. Now, as you can see, they didn't say dead anywhere there. Well, they said practically dead, but that isn't dead. Right? They're tricky, they're tricky. Right. <laughs> How can you be practically dead? <laughs> <laughs> Mostly dead. Dead from the head up. Yeah. <laughs> from the neck up. <laughs> yeah. That's what I was accused of sometimes when I was a kid. So there you go. But the truth of the matter is, bleaching is not done with bleach. That's why they trick us into thinking that bleaching means like they poured chlorine all over it or something. Chlorine, you know, uh, bleach all over it. And that would kill a person or a coral. 
But bleaching is not that. Bleaching is when the coral polyp, which is an animal, like a jellyfish, is in each one of the little tiny holes that on the surface, and they bring in plankton which are colored, which provide photosynthesis. It's a symbiotic relationship between the two. The coral protects the plankton from predation, putting it under its skin, which is translucent, so the sunlight can get through the skin to the plankton, and it makes sugar for the coral. It's a perfect relationship. This is not a dead coral. This is a coral waiting to take in the, its next choice of plankton, which they are amazingly good at. Somehow or other, every single one of the hundreds of thousands of polyps in this particular coral head knows which plankton to bring in, because they don't bring in different ones. But another one close by of the same species will bring in all of a different one. It's something to see. The Great Barrier Reef is now terminal. This was the next year. The first year was 2016, April. This is now, uh, when is it? There must be a date on there somewhere. Okay, Great Barrier Reef is now terminal. Great Barrier Reef at terminal stage. Scientists despair at latest coral bleaching data. The Great Barrier Reef is in its final terminal stage, as if there are other terminal stages before the final one. <laughs> And even the final one isn't dead, <laughs> right? Nothing there, nothing there is dead. It's just we must weep for the reefs. Oh, darn, that, that keeps happening to me. Um, okay, this is, now this is another year later, in 2018. Great Barrier Reef, definitely not dead. <laughs> Experts announced significant signs of recovery after mass bleaching. Great Barrier Reef showing signs of recovery. Great Barrier Coral Reefs show remarkable ability to recover from near death. How near can you get to death before you die? It's a philosophical question of some sort. Anyways, you see what I mean? And this was last year. Great Barrier Reef areas show the highest coral reef in 36 years, which is long as they've been measuring it. <laughs> right, this is, and this didn't make the big papers or the big magazines or the big news on TV. No, everybody still thinks it's dead. Only I've been there to see that it's not, because Eileen and I have gone to this area here three times on expeditions on a boat with about a dozen guests, uh, where you snorkel twice a day, every day for two weeks in the world's most biodiverse marine ecosystem which is the Coral Triangle. We've done to th gone to three different parts of Indonesia. We just returned a couple of months ago from the Banda Islands, which used to be called the Spice Islands, which is where the Europeans fought over the nutmeg and many were killed. It was a big f war to get the spices from these islands. And they are about the remotest part of all of Indonesia. And I'd love to show you my slideshow about it, but that's not the whole, I could tell you, do this whole thing in Coral Triangle. The warmest oceans in the world are in the Coral Triangle. Now there's a reason for that. The Caribbean is the second warmest ocean in the world. They're both close to the equator, and they're both protected north and south from cold water incursions. Australia, you see, is protecting that, and Asia is protecting the top of it, and the Caribbean's protected by North America and South America. But even still, in the last 50 million years since the Eocene thermal maximum, you'll remember, come down into this place to see an ice age, the Caribbean has lost 50% of its coral species. And they tell us that if the oceans get warm, they'll all die. No, if the oceans get warm, they will spread out much more. Because they were used to that warm period. This is the Pleistocene Ice Age. Corals don't like ice. You don't see a lot of corals in the Arctic. They've been reduced to a much smaller range than they were 50 million years ago. But there is a place where you go there and there's 600 species of coral and 2,200 species of reef fish. I don't think there's anywhere on the terrestrial environment where in a given hectare you would find as many species as there are in a given hectare of the coral reef in the Coral Triangle. So if you haven't seen this and you're lie then supple enough to still go over there and see it, 
you'll see half the world. You haven't seen half the world if you haven't seen this. The upper left, there's probably 40 species of coral just in this photograph. The little green thing is a nudibranch. There are hundreds of species of them. They have the most amazing diversity of colors, etc. Nudibranch means naked lung, and that squiggly thing on its back is its lungs. And it's, it's, there, it's very, very uh, large surface area. It's like feathers large surface area to get the oxygen out of the water. It's amazing that some fish in the ocean can live on one part per million oxygen. Five parts per million is considered reasonable. Ten parts per million is aerated. And they can live on that with their gills. As there's, there's so much surface area on the gills of the fish, just like there is on these lungs on this guy here. And that, what is that blue thing there? Clam. Got it. Giant clam. You should see the colors, the variety of colors they come in. It's just unbelievable. You would not believe that evolution could figure out how to make that many color combinations in a clam lip. You know? They're amazing. And the other picture is just of a bunch of fish. Uh, just a bunch of fish. Oh, let's turn to a completely different subject. This is the subject of waste management. And this is the diagram of a waste to energy plant, which in Germany and France is taking half their waste and turning it into energy. 4% of all Europe's electricity is from waste, using waste. We throw 50% of our waste into landfills. They also recycle theirs. So the, I, I, I can't talk too much longer on, on, on that, but um, why don't I have, why is this one here? Um, yeah, okay, I, I'm just gonna tell you that I've got, a, I've got a, a graph that shows that Western Europe is doing a really good job and Eastern Europe isn't doing a very good job on this. China has built the biggest waste to energy plant just recently and we throw so much stuff in the garbage. It's just ridiculous. All of any combustible material, wood, plastic and paper, well paper comes from wood of course, but all of those three can be put into a, a waste to energy plant. You know, short pieces of wood from demolition of buildings full of nails. But they burn the wood to get energy and the nails get melted and come out the bottom and they recycle it. And it's being done in a large number of Western European countries. And a lot of people just aren't catching on. Uh, actually, Greenpeace is against waste to energy. Because it's, you know what they're against? Fire. All fire. Anything that is burned, they're against. If you think about it, they're against all the fossil fuels. They're against burning waste. They're just plain against burning. They're not against smoking weed. <laughs> no siree. <laughs> well, they light up a doobie there, all right. And then they hate the world. I don't know why that is. They should be happy. Um, anyways, I'm not going to talk about this too much except to say that B shows that 75% of all the energy is for industrial, residential, and commercial, all of which is stationary, does not move. Transportation is only 25% of fossil fuel consumption. Anything that doesn't move can be done with nuclear energy. Cars, no, not so much, right? That's where we need fossil fuels. Ships. And Well, yes, uh, but I'm going to say, this is my point here, is that first we did 75% automatically, right? But about 40% of all energy consumption is in buildings. Everything that's in buildings can be run with nuclear heat, and electricity. Now, you're going to have your gas stove people like me not wanting to have it go quite though f so far, right? But I don't know what's going to happen about that. 
that are coming in with it. All these kinds of things can be done with nuclear energy. Steel mills, big industry, even mobile uh, dig diggers, uh, shovels in mines, they only move a little bit each day. They just have a cable to them that they move around with it. It's no big deal and it's very common. So there's lots of mobile things that can also be run with uh, nuclear energy. If you can take a hundred sailors underwater with a hundred nuclear missiles for two months, you can probably uh, use, a nuclear, use, use a nuclear energy in just about any ship. And that would include Russia's, super, Russia's icebreakers, which are all nuclear, six of them. And that's because they don't have to refuel partly in the, in the winter. They can go up there and stay there the whole winter back and forth keeping the lane open between Vladivostok and uh, on the west, I forget, uh, Mur 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 Murmansk, yeah. And uh, oil tankers could all be done with nuclear. Cargo ships could all be done with nuclear. A nuclear engine is no more difficult to run than a diesel engine. If you go into a nuclear plant, which I've been in many of them, they just have a bunch of screens and a bunch of buttons that they have to watch. And nobody's ever been killed in a nuclear accident in North America. The only accident that killed anybody was Chernobyl. It was a stupid reactor design where, where, where engineers came down and told the operators to turn off the safety systems while they did their experiment and it blew up. That was a nuclear explosion. And that was because it had a positive void coefficient as opposed to a negative void coefficient, which I will not tell you about. <laughs> but they are different. <laughs> one allows a nuclear explosion to happen in a nuclear if you do something wrong. The other one makes sure it never does. Because most reactors can't explode like a nuclear bomb. They can melt down, which is what Fukushima and Three Mile Island were. But that's nowhere near as serious because nobody died in, any, in either of those accidents. So nuclear is one of the most safest nu t uh, technologies we have. How many people die in coal mines in China every year? It's hundreds and thousands sometimes. So this is the answer. And now small modular nuclear reactors are coming. But, and, and of course, whoop, of course, uh, just, it's, I think it's because my thing is over there. All trains can be run on nuclear energy if they electrify the tracks. This is the most amazing technology. This is the, the parable of the loaves and fishes, where Jesus fed a multitude with one fish and four loaves of bread. Have I got that right? That's about right anyways. He fed thousands of people. Two, two, and, five. two and five? Two fish and five loaves of bread? Well, that, well, that would feed a multitude. <laughs> no, it would not, of course. But the thing about uranium, which is what we use for nuclear fuel, is only 0.8% of natural uranium is uranium-235, which is the only fissile isotope of uranium. Uranium-238, which is the remaining 99.2%, is fertile, but not fissile. And those two words are important. Uranium-235 is the only fissile isotope on the Earth naturally. Whereas uranium-238 can be converted into plutonium-239 in a uranium-235 reactor and you end up with more fuel you had in the first place. That's why it's called breeder reactor. And then there's thorium, which is also fertile and can be turned into uranium-233 and there's at least six to eight times as much thorium as there is uranium. So there's your loaves and fishes. And this is a Russian reactor, the third one they've built, the BN-800, I believe it's called, Big Nuclear 800. This is a fast breeder reactor running on plutonium that was created in uranium reactors. And there, they have three of these. This is an 880 megawatt one, which is up there with the big boys. And uh, it works real good. And they haven't had any trouble with them. And that means that the, your, the nuclear energy supply for the human population will last millennia. Not just hundreds of years, but thousands and perhaps ten thousands of years. And it's not nuclear waste then. They're calling uranium-238 that's left over from the reaction of 235, they're calling that nuclear waste. No, it is fuel for the future. 
This is the, I don't know how my slide got mixed up there, but this is the, the Western countries on the left-hand side. The orange is, uh, or is it, orange is waste to energy. Red is landfill. And green is recycling. So this goes from Western to Eastern Europe in a pretty well continuum. So you can see that the Western countries, some of them have basically no landfill, just a teeny little bit. It's probably hazardous waste or something like that. But you've got them 100%, just about 100% either recycling or using to make energy. And then it just keeps getting worse as you go into the East. But I, perhaps they will go ahead with it. One of the problems, though, is, is the whole environmental movement is against burning things, uh, even if it makes electricity. This is the Chinese uh, 168 megawatts, which is the size of a big gas plant or a medium-sized coal plant. There's a pretty sight. This is the campfire in uh, California, where almost 100 people were died. And this is what not to do, is to put suburbs in a pitchy pine forest that has never had the waste wood, wood, dead wood cleaned up off the bottom. As you can see, the trees fared better than the houses and better than many of the people. This is exactly what not to do. But mismanagement of forests in western US, because so much of it is federal land controlled from DC, and they have all these, you know, fairy tales about things. And uh, they don't understand it. One thing that's really important is to know that before fossil fuels were replaced almost all the wood that was used for industry and heating and stuff, every fall, every community, no matter how small or large, scoured the surrounding forest for dead wood for the winter. Because it's the easiest wood to get and it's already dry. So therefore, there was no fuel on the forest floor to go up and cause a crown fire in the pitchy pine needles. It still wouldn't have made, made any sense to do this. And this was an electric wire from PG&E going down on trees and starting them on fire when there should be no trees where an electric f f wire can come down. The same thing happened in, in uh, Lahaina. That was trees that got it going and from, the, from a line, the power line that came down. And then the idiot told him uh, not to go to the sea, go to the forest, yeah. which is where it was gonna get burnt. So uh, it was a total schmozzle that was. This is what you do if you know about urban uh, parks and green spaces. You don't put any coniferous trees in them because coniferous trees are pitchy by nature, most of them. Broadleaf trees are not, the, the, and they drop all their leaves in the fall and, and have new, nice, moist ones coming out with almost no pitch in them. And they leave open areas and water features and stuff, and there's never been a fire in here, and there never will be. But this is what's happening in the West. And in the federal forests, the national forests, the national parks, the, uh, the BNL, B, BLM lands, Bureau of Land Management lands, Idaho is 70% owned by the federal government because it's all in those various federal classifications. I'm getting there. Um, the U.S. forest area burned 1926 to 2017. The data before that black line, they have erased just like Canada is erasing its Arctic temperature records right now. But they erased that and they say, they erased it because they say they don't know where it came from. It came from them. Who else is measuring how much forest is burning in the United States besides the Forest Service? This is when Smokey the Bear was invented. And that's why they just brought it down and down and down and had good firefighting equipment and good, good routines. And now the reason it's going up now is because it's being mismanaged again because of green urban politicians who don't know a damn about forestry. In 1750, 
When wood was the only major fuel for heating industry and cooking, the forested area in Europe was reduced to less than 10%. Today, 43% of Europe is forested. In other words, the fossil fuels saved the forests, and also they learned silviculture, because up until 1750, people were just cutting the trees down and going away. Then they started learning how to breed trees and make them grow faster, and better, better species, better wood, da 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 da. And that's what has happened. That's today in Europe. A 4%, four times increase. More actually, a little more than four, four times increase. This is the Amazon rainforest, like today. This wasn't taken in 1800, because there weren't any cameras then, I don't think. <laughs> This picture shows that 90% of the Amazon rainforest is still intact. But this is part of the invisible fake catastrophes because no, hardly anybody ever goes there. Even Brazilians hardly ever go there. So they, can, they, they believe this propaganda by showing them one field that's been recently cut down for pasture. Well, there is pasture land in there, but it's not the nicest place to live. It's really hot and really sticky and full of snakes and other vermin. And, but some people live in there. This is the Belgian Congo in Africa. It's got a little bit of development in it, but not very much. This is right up to date. There's a couple of little towns in there, but most of it is still beautifully green. And this is the greening of the earth by carbon dioxide which has increased the biomass by 20 to 40 percent in places, which has made plants more efficient with water than they were when CO2 was so low, that is going to continue into the future for many, many decades and perhaps centuries. And it would be good if we returned CO2 to 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 ppm. But there's a diminishing return it levels off at around two to 3,000. It starts to, in other words, you have to add a larger amount to get the same amount of increased growth as time goes on. But still, we saved the world. And thank you very much for listening to me. such a bad species, are we? Some of us are smarter than others, too. So five minutes before we set the stage for the interview process, so don't go to Dairy Queen or go shopping at the mall. Go to the washroom, get a drink of water, and come right back. Thank you. And Dr. Moore, thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. It's amazing how actually good things are in that department. We only have to fear ourselves. Yes. Yeah. Yeah.